Welcome back to the NFL and You podcast. I'm your host, as always, Hayden Vassar, coming to you on Tuesday, October 22nd, uh, right around 2 Eastern on this uh, Tuesday after Week 7. And yeah, it was a very weird and just just weird overall Week 7. Weird and sloppy. Let's put it that way. It was weird and sloppy Week 7. Uh, we're going to get to all the games here in a second, all 14 of them. Uh, not a lot of news has happened. I know a couple trades have happened in the last uh, 24 hours. I think two trades have happened, but we'll get to those when we get to the respective teams. Uh, other than that, not a lot of news has happened. Uh, so we're just going to dive right into the recap portion. Uh, we're going to first mention that we went 8-6 and six with our picks on uh, Friday. So, you know, still above 500, so that's nice. But I'd like to first start off with the... Uh, First game that we we're gonna recap here. Let's let's go with uh, Rams and Falcons. Uh, Rams win this one, uh, thirty-seven to ten. And oh boy, the fal- the spiral of despair just keeps on going for Atlanta. Uh, uh, the Rams snap a three-game losing streak to improve to four and three, and Atlanta is in the middle of a five-game losing streak, falling to one and six. Uh, the Rams defense dominated in this game. Just had uh, Matt Ryan and that offense just out of sync the entire way. Uh, let's see here. The The Rams defense forced three turnovers, uh, two fumbles, one interception. Uh, they returned one of those fumbles for a touchdown. Uh, sacked Matt Ryan five times. It felt like they'd hit him a lot more than that throughout the game. And allowed 224 total yards in this game. Uh, it, it, it was a sloppy slow game to start. It was only 13-3 to L.A. at halftime. But then the Rams just blew it open in the second half and went on a 24-7 to run in the second half, marked by just just horrific defense by the Falcons. It, it, it was just bad. In the first half, it was sloppy, and neither team was really getting anything going. And then in the second half, the Rams just blew the doors off of them. It was sad. It was, it was honestly sad watching this game. But, but the key moment of this game came in the fourth quarter when Matt Ryan gets sacked by Aaron Donald. And he gets hurt. Uh, he apparently has a sort of high ankle injury. I, I've seen different people coin it different terms. They don't know if he's going to play next week. He was seen in a walking boot after this game. And uh, Matt Schaub, the former Houston Texans quarterback, came in to replace him. It, it, it was just a wholly bad day for the Falcons all around. Uh, uh, they're... Uh, Ito Smith, one of their running backs, got carted off with an injury, and their other running back, uh, Devontae Freeman, uh, threw a punch at Aaron Donald and got ejected for it. And the funniest part about that was, after he tried to punch Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald literally picked him up and carried him like a small child. <laughs> oh, the Falcons are such a joke right now. Uh, th- this was a get-right game for the Rams. Uh Jared Goff went 22 of 37 for 268 yards and two passing touchdowns. He also ran one touchdown in for, I think it was a three-yard touchdown. It was a get-right game. I I remember Todd Gurley played in this game. He had like a, oh, I don't even remember how long of a catch it was. It was probably like 25 to 30-yard catching touchdown. He played great in his first game back because he missed last week. This was a big get-right game for the Rams. Uh, Jalen Ramsey was in there, and people were saying, oh, the Rams are... Playing so fired up because they got Jalen Ramsey. No, it was more because of uh, they're playing a really, really bad Falcons team. Uh, Matt Ryan went 16 of 27 for 159 yards, an interception, and, a, and five sacks, like I mentioned. And time of possession in this one, uh, 37 minutes and 9 seconds to 22 minutes and 51 seconds in favor of the Rams. It was just, It was just domination. Just pure domination by the Rams, who... Get back in the winning column, and the and the Falcons are just circling the drain. They traded a uh, wide receiver Muhammad Sanu earlier today on Tuesday to the New England Patriots for a second round pick. So that shows you about what they think of their season. They already know it's done. And we're gonna leave it on this note. They they said that they were gonna uh, owner Arthur Blank uh, said after the game he still supports Dan Quinn for now. He didn't say for now, but that's what he said after the game. He just said he still supports them, but we'll 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 see what they do in the next coming weeks because they're one and six, and they just traded one of their wide receivers, their number three wide receiver. But they they're starting to give away assets now. That shows you where they're at. 
All right, moving on to our uh, next game, uh, Dolphins at Bills. An actually surprisingly close one in Buffalo. Uh, Bills win this one 31-21. Uh, the Bills uh, are in the middle of a two-game winning streak. Yeah, two-game winning streak. Or 5-1. and one. Miami still winless and 0-6 and on the year. So here's the thing. Dolphins led for the majority of this game. <laughs> I know, stunningly. Uh, going into the fourth quarter, it was I think it was like 14-9 to nine going into the fourth quarter. Anyway, uh, Bills go on a 22-7 to seven run to take the lead uh, in the fourth quarter. The Dolphins just horrifically collapse. There's two turnovers by Tredavious White, and the Bills make them pay with those turnovers. They score, they score touchdowns on each one of those turnovers, but Ryan Fitzpatrick gets the ball back late and scores a touchdown to pull the Dolphins within three. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, here come the freaking Dolphins. And the Dolphins decide to go for the onside kick. And no team this year has converted an onside kick because of the way that the NFL has changed the rules. Well, on the onside kick, the Dolphins did the most Dolphins thing ever. They go for the onside kick, but the Bills recover it. Uh, Defender Micah Hyde recovers it and then runs it all the way back. Oh, what was it, like 47 yards or something like that? 47 yards untouched for a touchdown to ice the game with a minute 38 left and the most Dolphins ending possible. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, the, the Dolphins had a lead for most of this game. The Bills' offense was horrifically sloppy in the first half, and the Dolphins were driving downfield on this very good Bills defense. I, if I remember correctly, Ryan Fitzpatrick in that offense had two touchdown drives that lasted... Uh, 75 yards or more, they were they were moving downfield on this defense, and they're going into the fourth quarter with a five-point lead. But the Bills just explode in the fourth quarter. Like I said, 22-7 to seven run in the fourth quarter to end the game. Allen's uh, two touchdown drives, he looked great in the fourth quarter, but that's the problem. He's just, he'll look great in spurts, but not for an entire game. The Dolphins, but the Dolphins just horrifically collapsed in the fourth quarter. Uh, like I said, Fitz Ma- Fitzmagic actually provided a spark uh, for this team. I, I was really surprised because uh, I really thought Josh Rosen was the better quarterback on this roster, but Fitzmagic went 23 of 35 for 282 yards, a touchdown, and an interception. He played well. Uh, Josh Allen, on the other hand, went 16 of 26 for 202 yards, two touchdowns, and two sacks. Josh Brown, who's, who is becoming their number one wide receiver in Buffalo, five catches, 83 yards, and a touchdown. I still have doubts about this Bills offense. I don't think it's good enough to win a playoff game, but I think their defense is. I just think they were really sleepwalking in this one and were really looking past a bad Dolphins team. Uh, I, I was really stunned sitting there watching this, not just that the Dolphins had a lead in the fourth quarter, but they were looking like the better team going into that fourth quarter. I mean, you watch that game, the Dolphins look like the better team for most of that game. But they just couldn't pull it out, and the Bills go to 5-1 and one as a result, and it's their best start since 2008. And you look at their upcoming schedule, I think the Bills could seriously not just win 10 games, I think they could seriously win 11-12 to 12 games. They still got to play the Jets again. They still got to play the Dolphins again. Throw in uh, Steelers in there as well. I think there's a Washington game thrown in there as well. Oh, and also the Eagles who are looking pretty bad right now. This this Bills team could seriously, seriously win 12 games this year. Their schedule is that soft. Uh, but Bills win a wild one this weekend, and poor Dolphins. they just coming so close the last two weeks for to wins, and just blowing it in the most unique and Dolphins way possible. Just so sad. Uh, once again, Bills win this one 31-21. And Bills improved to 5-1. and Miami still winless on the year at 0-6. Uh, moving on to our next one. Jags at Bengals. Another really close one that surprised me. Uh, Jags win this one 27-17. Uh, Jaguars snap a two-game losing streak. Improved to 3-4. and four. Uh, Cincinnati falls to 0-7. It's their it's their worst start in probably a decade, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, the Bengals had a lead going into the fourth quarter, just like the the Dolphins did. Uh, Cincinnati held a 10-9 lead at the start of the fourth quarter, but 
at the start of the fourth quarter, Jaguars had the ball, and Minshew leads a touchdown drive to take the lead back. And then Andy Dalton throws three just horrific interceptions in the, in the fourth quarter to absolutely sink any hope the Bengals had of winning this game. Just any hope is over. Uh, uh, Jacksonville closes out on a 18-7 uh, to run in the fourth quarter to give the game the final score. It was just horrifically bad. Uh, oh yeah, and one of those interceptions was a pick six. So imagine that. Jaguars scored the go-ahead touchdown and go up, and then Dalton immediately throws a pick six to just pile everything on top of them. It was, it was about as bad as you can get for the Bengals in front of a mostly empty Cincinnati stadium. Uh, Fournette had a big day. Uh, he rushed for, let's see here, it was like, yeah, 29 rushes for 131 yards. This Bengals rush defense is atrocious. They've rushed for, I think it was like 300 yards on uh, rushing offense, but they've given up over 1,000 rushing yards so far through this season. They've been outrushed over 1,000 yards. That is horrifically bad. But for the Jaguars, Fournette played good. Minshew didn't have his best game until the fourth quarter really started. That's when, you know, everything kind of clicked for the Jaguars' offense. But their defense stepped up. You know, it only held uh, uh, the Bengals to one offensive touchdown. Uh, no, it was two touchdowns. Yeah, two touchdowns. But, you know, that last one that the Bengals had, it was in garbage time when the game was already out of hand. Uh Minshew went 15 of 32 for 255 yards, a touchdown, and two sacks. Uh, D.D. Westbrook, their wide receiver, six catches, 103 yards. But Andy Dalton, 22 of 43, 276 yards, a touchdown, three interceptions, uh, four rushes for uh, 33 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Alex Erickson, their wide receiver, eight catches, 137 yards. It was just a bad day for the Bengals. Bengals are very bad. Uh, mostly empty stadium there. 0-7 team. Uh, you got you got to wonder if this is going to be a team that's going to be a trade candidate for teams. You know, just become a fire sale. Start dumping players. Like, I'm going to be honest. You know what sounds really interesting? Andy Dalton being traded to Chicago. I'm serious. Andy Dalton to Chicago. Let's do it. Uh, I mean, Mohamed Sanu goes for a second round pick, so what does A.J. Green go for? I'm serious. What would AJ Green go for right now? Uh, Bengals are bad. Uh, Jaguars, they're going to be up and down uh, the entire season. They're a very trendy team in terms of how they win and lose games. They lost two to start the year. Then they won two in a row. Then they lost two in a row. So now they win next week and win two in a row and then lose two in a row after that. They're going to be an up and down team is what I'm getting at. They're just going to ride the Minshew Mania train, baby. That's how it works. But their defense stepped up today, and their run game helped keep the offense flowing and steady. And Jaguars got a much-needed win, Snap once again snapping a two-game losing streak and improving to 3-4 and four on the year. And an AFC South that's suddenly getting competitive again. <laughs> All right, moving on to our next one. Uh, Vikings at Lions, a real big shootout in uh, Detroit. Surprised by the final score of this one. Vikings win 48, no, not 48, 42 I can't read my own handwriting. 42 to 30. Uh, Vikings improved to 5 and 2 and are riding a three game winning streak. The Vikings are white hot right now. And Detroit falls to 2 3 and 1 and are in the middle of a three game losing streak. And it feels like the season's starting to get away from the Lions. Uh, Cousins stays white hot as Vikings outlast the Lions in this one. Uh, in the. Uh, in the first half, the, this game was going back and forth, back and forth. Each team taking shots at each other and scoring touchdowns. I mean, at halftime, it was uh, tied at 21. Both teams scored 21 points in the first half, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, this game's fun. I, I was keeping an eye on this game out of all the other ones on at 1 o'clock because it was the most entertaining. But then once the second half started... Uh, it was all Minnesota as Minnesota goes on a 21-9 to, 21 to 9 run in the second half to close out the Lions. 
Uh, the Vikings are a different team now. And you want to know why they're a different team now? They're aggressive now. With two plus minutes left, it's a short uh, down situation. I don't really remember if it's like third down or whatever, but it's a short down and distance. And you, you think, okay, here's what the Vikings are going to do. They're up by just a couple of points. You think they're going to run the ball, waste clock, and play defense. You know what they actually do? They uncork a 66-yard pass to Stephon Diggs to put a dagger in the throat of the Lions. I watched that happen and my jaw hit the floor. These aren't the same Vikings we saw three weeks ago. This is... They have changed completely. They are no longer a ultra-conservative, run-heavy team. This is a team that will throw the ball all over the yard and when it comes down to it, will put their foot on your throat and squeeze as hard as they can. This team is different, they are aggressive, and I absolutely love it. I told the Lions, not the Lions, I told the Vikings a couple weeks ago, after they lost to the Bears, to show me something. Show me that you're not a one-dimensional mess. And you know what? They're absolutely proven that they aren't. And I absolutely love it. The Vikings' entire coaching staff and players deserve an insane amount of credit for this complete change in their identity that we are seeing. This was this is not the same team that we saw through the first few weeks. This is a completely different team that is flat out dangerous and teams need to be afraid of the Vikings. Uh, I don't want to get into too many specifics about what Kirk Cousins has done these last couple weeks because I want to save that for the Thursday night free a Thursday night preview portion later in the show because they're playing Washington on Thursday night. But I'm in love with what the Vikings are doing right now. I am thrilled beyond belief. Uh, uh, Kirk Cousins is now the first quarterback in league history to throw for at least 300 yards with a 130-plus passer rating in three straight games. Otherwise known as, Kirk Cousins is flat-out balling right now. Stefan Diggs had another great game in this one. Uh, seven catches, 142 yards. Dalvin Cook had a big day too. 25 rushes for 142 yards and two touchdowns. And Kirk Cousins, like I just mentioned, 24 of 34 for 337 yards and four touchdowns. The Vikings are a different team, and it's beautiful. Uh, uh, Adam Thielen, though, the Vikings wide receiver, left in the, I think it was the first half with a hamstring injury. Uh... Big question now is, is, is he going to play Thursday? Uh, uh, the Vikings have gone back and forth. They say he might play, but some people around the organization have said it might be a week-to-week injury, so we don't know if he plays. But if he misses, Stefan Diggs is playing well. Uh, Mason Rudolph, their tight end, came back into the fold on the offense, caught his first touchdown of the season in this game. Uh, the Vikings are fun is what I'm getting at. They're very fun to watch. But the Lions are also fun, in my opinion. Uh, Matt Stafford had a really good day, too. Uh, became the fastest quarterback to reach 40,000 passing yards in NFL history. He went 30 of 45 for 369 yards, four touchdowns. All of those to Marvin Jones, by the way. And one interception and two sacks. Danny Amendola, eight catches, 105 yards. But like I said, Marvin Jones, 10 catches, 93 yards, four touchdowns. First Lions receiver in history to catch four touchdowns in one game. Think about that for a minute. The same organization that had Calvin Johnson, a.k.a. Megatron, roaming the field at one point, and Marvin Jones is the first guy in Lions history to catch four touchdowns in a game? That's insane. But like I said, it was a kind of a shootout of a game. Uh... And the and the Vikings just put their foot on the Lions' throat with two minutes left and just didn't let up. Uh, the I I I was watching this game and for the life of me, these first couple weeks, I've been trying to figure out what's the problem with the Lions. And when I was watching this game, it finally clicked for me. The Lions don't know how to close games, uh, and their defense has officially become a liability because it couldn't get a stop when it mattered the most. But their issue is. They've been in close games basically this entire season. Uh, think about week one when they tied with the Cardinals. And then even in the games that they won, they're super tight and close against the Eagles and Chargers. 
and then super tight on Monday night against Green Bay, and I'm forgetting one of their other losses. But you get my point. They've been in every single game. They just can't finish. They're right there in the fourth quarter. They're just struggling to finish. But I do think they're a better team than they were last year, and I think the Lions are fun to watch now. And honestly, I think this might have been game of the weekend. This was this was probably the most fun game of the weekend. Uh, once again, Vikings win this one 42-30. Vikings improved to 5-2. and two. Detroit falls to 2-3-1. and one. And uh, Vikings are dangerous. If you couldn't tell by my absolute throffing at the mouth for them. <laughs> They're dangerous and fun, and I love it. Uh, moving on to our next one. Oakland Raiders at Green Bay Packers. Uh, Packers win this one 42-24. Uh, Packers improved to 6-1 and one and are riding a three-game winning streak. Raiders uh, snap a two-game uh, winning streak and fall to 3-3 three and three on the year. Uh, Rodgers had a flat-out historic day. Six total touchdowns, five of them passing in this one. Uh, become the becomes the first Packers quarterback in history to finish the game with a perfect passer rating, which is insane when you think about because you got to think of the Hall of Famers who have played on the Packers, uh, Brett Favre, Bart Starr, just to name two good ones. There have been a, a plethora of other quarterbacks that have played there, and you're telling me Aaron Rodgers is the first one to ever do this? Is insane. Uh but in the first half, the Raiders were proven to be frisky. They were they were hanging around. It was uh, fourteen to ten Packers late in the first half. Rodgers gets the ball back with like a minute and thirty, or maybe it was two minutes left, and he leads this very quick touchdown drive uh, down the field uh, to go t- to go up twenty one ten right at the half, and that was the moment the game was over. Packers go up by eleven points at half, and it was over at that point. The, the Raiders had no answer in the second half. Uh, they they just couldn't get anything going uh, through the air, even though, even though they, they were trying pretty hard, in my opinion. I think this Raiders team is being coached well by uh, John Gruden, and they're, and they're proven to be frisky, but they're just not meant to score a lot of points. They're just not. Uh, it, has to, it has to be a low-scoring game. I think the Raiders top out usually at 24 points. I think that's their absolute limit. I mean, Derek Carr went for 22 of 28 for 293 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. He didn't play bad. It's just they're not meant to score points. Josh Jacobs played really well. The Raiders running back, 21 rushes, 124 yards. Uh, Darren Waller, the Raiders tight end who signed that big contract extension uh, in the middle of last week, seven catches, 126 yards, and and those two touchdowns. Uh, So... I think the Raiders are well coached. It just has to be a low scoring grind out game for them to be competitive. And and I think they're going to be frisky. They're going to be tough to handle for some teams. If you're expecting a cakewalk when you play the Raiders, you're going to be stunned. Just ask the Bears and Colts. Uh, but speaking to uh, the Packers, I feel like the Packers are starting to round into form here. I mean, their rushing game wasn't that much of a factor. They had 23 total rushes in this game for 60 total yards. It was all Aaron Rodgers in this game. And this was his best game of the season. This is the second time this season he's thrown for over 400 yards in a game. This Packers team is becoming flat-out dangerous. And they're starting to look an awful lot like a team that's going to be competing for a uh, either one or two seed at the end of the year. They're They're becoming... Dangerous, and the scary part is when I say they're rounding into shape, I think they can get better. Imagine what they're like with with Rodgers clicking on all cylinders, and that running game is getting uh, work done. Imagine that. Imagine how scary that is, because it's terrifying. Aaron Jones, uh, in this game, the Packers running back, he didn't have a good day rushing, but he caught like a thirty yard, amazing touchdown catch, a very difficult catch in the end zone. From Rodgers, uh, it was just a tough day. I I don't think anybody could have stopped this. Uh, But like I said, the Raiders aren't meant to score a lot of points. 24 24 points to 27 points is probably their limit. Uh, But most of their damage felt like it was done in the second half and the game was out of hand. They're a low-score, grind-out kind of team. Uh, Packers are dangerous. Let me read you Rodgers' final stat line. 25 of 31 for 429 yards, five touchdowns, and one sack. That one sack, by the way, Mason Crosby, not Mason Crosby, Max Crosby, my mistake, 
Max Max Crosby, the Raiders' rookie defensive end that they took in the fourth round from my uh, University of Eastern Michigan. Represent, Eagles. Turn up. Uh, Max Crosby's a player. Just saying. Just saying. I, I was screaming that at the draft, and nobody would listen to me. Uh, Marquez Valdez-Scanling for the Packers. Uh, their wide receiver, two catches, 133 yards, and one touchdown. I think most of that came on, I think it was like an 80-yard catch and run by uh, Scanling. Packers are dangerous. Uh, also in this game, Rodgers became fastest quarterback to throw for 350 touchdowns. Did it in 172 games. Dude's a Hall of Famer. <laughs> this was the game that I think Twitter had been waiting for because a lot of people on Twitter were saying Rodgers is done and overrated. He ain't done. This team is dangerous and scary. And you and people need to be afraid. I can't wait for this Vikings team that is suddenly clicking on all cylinders to play this Packers team that's finding their offense. Oh my gosh, that game might be like 55-54 to 54 as a final, and I'm going to love it. <laughs> Once again, Packers win this one. Uh, moving on to our next one. Uh, Houston at Indy. Uh, Colts win this one 30-23. Uh, Colts improved to 4-2, and two, riding a two-game winning streak. Uh, Houston falls to 4-3, and three, snaps a two-game winning streak. Uh, Jacoby Brissett, the Colts quarterback, throws a career-high four touchdowns to move the Indianapolis Colts in the first place in the AFC South. You heard that right. Uh, wow. Darius Leonard, uh, the Colts' uh, all-pro linebacker, played in his first game since week two, if I remember correctly, uh, because of a concussion, and he got the game-sealing interception off of Watson with 26 seconds left to ice the game. This was a very just weird game. The... the Texans were out of sync. Uh, Watson was getting pressured the entire game, got sacked three times. And uh, that's the Achilles heel for this Texans team. If they can't protect Deshaun Watson, they will not have a good day. Uh, uh, he threw two interceptions. Yeah, Watson threw two interceptions. The one of Darius Leonard was tipped, but the other one, Watson was rolling off of his feet and he just threw it off of his back foot. It was just an ugly pick by Watson. Uh, Indianapolis jumped out into an early 7 and nothing lead in the first quarter, and they never relinquished it. Uh, Watson, like I mentioned, was under pressure all game. But there was a moment in the first half where uh, it looked like Watson was about to throw a touchdown pass, and he had a defender draped on him. And the referee called a very rarely called uh, play, uh, the in-the-grasp call, which means that he's down even though he wasn't really down. It's a very weird play. It's hard to describe, so if you get a chance, go watch it. And it's called the, you know, protect quarterbacks, but with a guy like Deshaun Watson, you know, you kind of want to just let it play out. Because it wiped a touchdown off the board. Granted, looking back at it, it could have maybe changed momentum, but in the grand scheme of things, I don't think if you add on four points, because the, the Texans settled for a field goal on that drive, I don't think adding four points to the score would have changed anything. But it was a horrific call. And it was bad, but I don't think it would have changed much. Uh, he, Indianapolis was just a better team throughout most of this game. Let's be brutally honest about it. And then there was that instance late in the game where Bill O'Brien takes a safety instead of punting for field position. I didn't really understand that, and it gave the Colts two more points to make it a seven-point game. And you're thinking, why would you do that? It, it, it was questionable. It, it wasn't the Texans' best day. It just wasn't. Uh, but like I said, it all comes down to as long as Houston protects Deshaun Watson, if he has pressure constantly in his face, it doesn't matter even if he's getting sacked. Because cause only three sacks in this game is probably like one of the lowest totals he's been sacked this entire season. Being honest about it. You know, he's been sacked seven, six. It, a lot of times they've just not protected him at all. But if you can protect him and keep pressure off of him, he'll win you games. Uh... But when it's pressured like this, and you look at all of their losses so far this season, it's when Deshaun Watson is getting sacked in bunches and getting pressure all over him. That's when they lose. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins, the Texas wide receiver, nine catches, 106 yards, one touchdown. Kenny Stills, four catches, 105 yards. But let's sit here and praise the Colts for a minute. I think their head coach, Frank Reich, deserves Coach of the Year. Here's why. You have your all-pro amazing 
franchise quarterback retire at age 29, middle of his prime, to shock the entire football world literally a, what was it, two weeks, a week and a half before the season started? And everybody's sitting there thinking, oh God, the Colts are going to be such a mess this year. Well, with no Andrew Luck, they're going to be awful. And all of a sudden, they're they're sitting here four, uh, four and two. I almost said four and three. Four and two on top of their own division playing like Andrew Luck never left. Jacoby Brissett is not just a placeholder. He is seriously a good starting quarterback in this league. He is playing lights out with two wins over the Chiefs and Texans in their last two games. The Colts are for real, and they're going to be in every single game this year. They are well coached. Uh, their their roster is so stacked and talented. And it just shows that good coaching can overcome almost any obstacle. Yeah, you, you, You'll hear coaches uh, say, oh, you know, we've had injuries... You know, on on a couple places on our team, so we can't really. It, it's understandable that we're struggling. Yeah, look what the Colts have done. Missing their All Pro linebacker for a couple games. Missing their. Uh, I don't know if Malik Hooker's an All Pro. I don't know if he got named to the All Pro team. Missing a great player in your secondary, Malik Hooker, for a couple games. Uh, uh, Marlon Mack is banged up beyond belief. Oh yeah, and Andrew Luck retired a week and a half before the season started. And you're four and two after week seven. And you're in first place in your division. It just shows what good coaching can do for a team. Frank Reich deserves coach of the year, people. Just saying. Alright, once again, Colts win this one 30 to 23. Uh moving on to our next one. Uh Arizona Cardinals at New York Giants. Uh Cardinals win this one 27 23. Cardinals improved to 3-3-1 three, three, and one on the year. Now at 500, they they've won three straight. First time the Cardinals have won three straight since uh, 2015. Yeah, it's been a while, Cardinals. And the Giants fall to 2-5 and five and have lost three straight. Uh, this was a rain-soaked game in New York. Uh, heavily impacted the game. Neither quarterback played good. Kyler Murray went 14 of 21, 104 yards, two sacks. Uh, Daniel Jones, 22 of 35 for 223 yards, a touchdown, and an, inter- and an interception. Uh, but Chase Edmonds, this was the Chase Edmonds games, uh, game. Uh, the backup running back for Arizona because David Johnson, their starter, was apparently banged up going into this one. Chase Edmonds balled out, had a career high in uh, carries, yards, and touchdowns. 27 carries for 126 yards and three touchdowns. Chase Edmonds balled out in this game. Uh, Chase Edmonds leads the way on offense for the Cardinals as their defense dominated Daniel Jones. Uh, Their defense sacked uh, Daniel Jones eight times and forced three turnovers in this game. Uh, The Cardinals' defense looked great. This was the best game they've played all year, undoubtedly. Not just on defense. I would argue this is their most complete game all season as an entire team. Uh, Chandler Jones, their defender, got four sacks on his own and a forced fumble. Patrick Peterson in his first game back from a suspension, a sack and a forced fumble. Uh, man, it, it was just, wow. It, the Giants are in a bad place offensively, and you know they're in a bad place when they make the Cardinals' defense look good. I mean, oh my goodness. Uh, Cardinals are really feeling themselves right now. They really are. And I know they've played, you know, three of the worst teams in the league the last three weeks. And that's probably why they've won three in a row. But still, they've won three in a row and are above 500. I, I'm really surprised, and the Cardinals are fun. That entire NFC West is fun because every single team right now is either five at 500 or higher. The NFC West is fun. <laughs> oh, it's so much fun. Uh, I'm... I I said before this game, I said on Friday, keep an eye on the Giants because they could be frisky in the NFC East. Uh, but now they're two and five, and I'm ready to abandon that ship. Uh, the Giants are a bad team. Their offensive line hasn't been playing the best, and I know they got Saquon Barkley back in this game, and I, and he didn't play the best. I think he had like 75 rushing yards, but it was a rain-soaked game, and it impacted a lot. 
Uh, rain impacted a lot of games this weekend, but I just don't think the Giants are a good team. They're going to ride Daniel Jones, you know, for the rest of the year as they should. And he's a rookie, and he's going to struggle. Every rookie struggles. So when he doesn't play good, like he didn't play good in this game, they're going to lose. They're going to be bad. It's as simple as that. Uh, the Giants are not a good team, but what are the Cardinals? What are the Cardinals? I guess we'll find out next week when they play the Saints. Uh, once again, Cardinals win this one 27-21. Moving on. Uh, San Francisco at Washington. Oh, boy. Uh, San Francisco wins this one 9 nothing, And probably the ugliest game we'll get all season long. Uh, a torrential downpour in uh, Landover, Maryland for this game. Uh, is it Maryland? I always forget where they play at Washington. Anyway, the Washington football stadium. Uh, if you go back and watch this game, it's a heavy wind throughout. It's a, it's a lot of heavy rain throughout as well. But the San Francisco defense dominates a horrifically sloppy game and a downpour. Uh, the Niners are now the first defense, uh, yeah, first defense since 2005 to limit an opponent to seven or fewer points and fewer than 200, uh, net yards of offense in three consecutive games. Uh, in this game, they, uh, gave up 154 total yards and 77 passing yards. It, it was bad. I think Adrian Peterson was the Washington football team's best offensive weapon in this game, and he had like 22 rushes for 80 yards. I think he got he got an ankle injury in this game. He's questionable for Thursday night's game against Minnesota, and you know he wants to play in that. Uh, it was it was tied at zero at halftime, to give you an indication of what this game was, and then Robbie Gold, the 49ers kicker, kicks three field goals in the second half to. Lift the Niners past Washington. It, it it was an uh it was an ugly game, very ugly. There weren't a lot of passes in this one. Uh, for instance, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo went twenty of twenty one for one hundred and fifty one yards, an interception, and two sacks. Uh, Case Keenum, the Washington quarterback, went nine of twelve for seventy seven yards and three sacks. But each, but think about that. Uh. The Niners sacked him three times on 12 pass attempts. So they sacked him. They were getting a sack every four passes. That's crazy. They were getting they were getting sacks on like 25% of his uh, passes. That's crazy. And they, they probably could have had more, but since, you know, they weren't dropping back to pass a whole bunch. That's why. Uh, but this game came down to Nick Bosa getting a sack on Case Keenum to end the game with like 30 seconds left. Uh, Washington had no timeouts, and after he got the sack, he did a uh, slip and slide celebration, which was really funny. <laughs> and watching these guys slide all over the field every time they missed a tackle was hilarious because they would hit the turf and then they would slide about fifteen to twenty feet <laughs> with no control. It was hilarious. Uh, uh, but like I said, the weather heavily impacted this game. But this was a game that shows you that Washington, not Washington, that San Francisco can win in different ways. Uh, in a sloppy game where nothing goes right, they can they can kick field goals and their defense will grind out a win. I think that's a hallmark of a good team that they can win in different ways. That when when nothing is going right, they can find a way to win. That's that's how you can determine what is a good team and what isn't a good team. But after this game, uh, San Francisco head coach Kyle Shanahan uh, gave the game ball to his dad, Mike Shanahan. And if you don't know anything about football history the last decade, uh, Mike Shanahan was once the head coach of the Washington football team and was unceremoniously fired in, what was that, 2013? Kyle Shanahan was also on that coaching staff in Washington. So I had to I have to imagine that Kyle Shanahan's team rolling into Washington and winning an ugly, sloppy game and then giving the game ball to his dad after the game probably felt really good for Kyle Shanahan. Just saying. Once again, 49ers win this one 9-0. Uh, moving on into the first of the late games. Uh, uh, Los Angeles Chargers at Tennessee Titans. This was a wild ending. 
Uh, Titans win this one 23 to 20. Uh, Titans improve to three and four on the year, snap a two game losing streak. And the poor Chargers fall to two and five on the year in the middle of a three game losing streak. This was actually the Titans' first win in their home stadium this season. So I got, I got to set the stage for you because this is only the Chargers would lose this game. This is this this kind of ending would only happen to the Chargers. So here's here's the setup. Titans have the ball at about midfield with less than two minutes left. It's fourth and inches, and Ryan Tannehill decides he's going to sneak the ball. Okay, go for the throw. Try to run out the clock. I get it. I like it. He doesn't get it. He gets stuffed. Chargers take over, and they start dipping and diving downfield, using Austin Eckler a lot, which shows you what they think about Melvin Gordon. And they're getting into range, and they and Philip Rivers hits Austin Eckler on a 16-yard pass. With, with what looks like the go-ahead touchdown. And the Chargers are celebrating. They're like, oh, we, we did it. We came back. Eckler's the hero. Well, re- well, they go to replay, and it shows Eckler's butt was down at the one-yard line. <laughs> so they wipe the touchdown off the board. And, and at this point, it's under a minute left after it looked like Eckler had gotten in. So they hand the ball off to Melvin Gordon at the one-yard line. And, the, and it looks like he got in. And the Chargers are celebrating. Oh, now we got the touchdown. Everything's good. They go to replay again. And it shows that Melvin Gordon didn't get in. And they wipe that touchdown off the board. So within the span of like 30 seconds, the Chargers thought they had got the go-ahead touchdown twice. And it's taken away from them. So now it's less than 30 seconds. Clock's ticking. They run Melvin Gordon again. Keep in mind, it's a three-point game. Chargers have no timeouts, and they are well within field goal range. They decide to go for the win, and I absolutely respect and admire that decision. A lot of teams would have just kicked it, and that's coaching scared. Chargers decide to go for the win. So they hand the ball off to Melvin Gordon for a second time at the one-yard line, and there's mass confusion in the pile. Suddenly, Titan players are sprinting away from the pile up, going the opposite way. And the clock's still running, and I'm screaming at my TV, what's going on? Time's running out. Chargers, you got to get to the line. Well, they go to replay, and Melvin Gordon fumbled the ball at the one-yard line, and Jarrell Casey, the Titans defender, picks it up and recovers it. Titans recover at the one-yard line, literally the one-inch yard line, and win the game. This only happens to the Chargers. They find new and creative ways to lose and have been doing it for a decade. Oh my gosh, it was so crazy. Uh, uh, it, it, it was a goal line stand for the ages. It, it truly was because Chargers think they have the, the go-ahead touchdown on at least two of those tries. And I was willing to bet that they would have gotten it with Gordon at the one. A goal line stand for the ages by the Titans to get a much needed win. Uh, Tannehill, Ryan Tannehill provided a much needed spark for uh, the Titans. He felt like he was pushing the ball uh, uh, more downfield throughout this game, even though he didn't play his best football. He went 23 of 29 for 312 yards, two touchdowns, had that interception and two sacks. But I think Ryan Tannehill played a lot better than Marcus Mariota. I don't know if Mariota's thrown for 300 passing yards this season. I don't really remember if he has or not. I think Ryan Tannehill basically just solidified his starting job for the next couple weeks. And Derrick Henry went 22 of 90 for a rushing touchdown. Uh, but man, that it was just a crazy ending to a crazy game. Uh, they were tied at halftime. I remember that. I think it was like 10-10 at halftime. It was like 10-10 or 13-13. It was something like that. Uh, it was just a crazy ending, and the Titans' defense, which is the best part of this team, stood up and won the game for them. I think Phillip Rivers played okay in this game. He went 24 of 38 for 329 yards and two touchdowns. They just have no running game. I mean, since Melvin Gordon came back, the running game is worse. They had, like, what, 21 rushes for 39 yards. That's averaging 1.9 yards per carry. But they couldn't even get that one yard when they needed it the most. Uh, Austin Eckler 
had five rushes for seven yards, but he caught seven passes for 118 yards and a touchdown. Oh, poor Melvin Gordon. I mean, you could tell he was already kind of in a dark place during his holdout because nobody seemed to really care about him. Nobody was talking about him or anything like that. And then he comes back, and he's just playing not good football. I mean, they get to the one-yard line, and Melvin Gordon can't even get one yard. That's embarrassing. And I know this Chargers team is banged up. I know they lost an offensive lineman in this game. I think it was, I think it was Forrest Lamp, as I think as his name was. Broke a femur. He's out for the year. More injuries for this Chargers team. Uh, Chargers are a bad team. And it's more than just the injuries. They're a bad team. They're snake bit. And now we're going back to the days of Chargers finding creative ways to lose. The Chargers are a bad team this season. One of the, one of the bigger disappointments of this season is the Chargers. But for the Texans, I mean, not the Texans, the Titans, they're right back into this. I mean, they were they were able to protect Ryan Tannehill. It, it, I bet Marcus Mariota misses the days when he was only sacked twice and not eight times in a game. But he was pushing the ball downfield. He got uh, the wide receivers, Brown involved. Uh, it, it was helping that he would hit them and they would catch and run. But I think Tannehill is basically taking over the job now. And I think he should have it because Mariota has not played well. Once again, Titans win a wild one, 23 to 20. Titans improve to three and four. Chargers fall to two and five. Just a big old disappointment. All right, moving on to our next one: Saints at Bears. Saints win this one, 36 25. New Orleans improves to six and one, and are riding high on a five-game winning streak. Chargers fall. I'm not Chargers. Bears fall to three and three, and are in the middle of a three-game losing streak where it feels like everything is going wrong for the Bears. I know the score says 36-25, and that says an 11-point victory for the Saints. It wasn't that close. The scoreline could read 36-3, and that would be more accurate of what this game was. The Saints' offense exploded in this game, while the Bears' offense imploded. Uh, you got to remember, the Saints didn't have Alvin Kamara. He was ruled out. Uh, they also didn't have uh, Jared Cook, their starting tight end. No problem. No problem at all. Latavius Murray went off in this game. Uh, their backup running back, 27 rushes, 119 yards, and two touchdowns. Michael Thomas, their star wide receiver, nine catches, 131 yards. Teddy Bridgewater, Teddy Two Gloves, 22 of 38 for 281 yards, two touchdowns, and a sack. My man is balling in New Orleans. He is going to get himself a starting job next year, and he deserves it. He is playing some great football. And it helps that that team is stepping up around him. Uh, but the Saints' defense was the story in this game and how they pushed around a Bears offense that felt like they didn't even belong on an NFL field. Uh, I, I mean, it, it was bad. It was horrendously bad. Uh Time of possession in this one. The New Orleans had 37 minutes and 26 seconds. Chicago had 22 minutes and 34 seconds. Uh, the, I think that defense is good, but they're playing tougher competition now. So you can't leave them on the field. They, they played an easier schedule last year. So they could get by with their quarterback not playing well. I think this Bears defense would be fine if they could just get average quarterback play. They aren't even getting that. They are getting well below average quarterback play. Mitch Trubisky in this game. First game back from a shoulder injury. So why in the blue hell is he attempting 54 pass attempts? That reflects directly on Matt Nagy and that coaching staff. 34 of 54 for 251 yards, two touchdowns, and two sacks. Most of that came in garbage time when the game was well out of hand. His stat line before he... He got the touchdowns in the, in the later part of the game was much worse. Allen Robinson, 10 catches, uh, 87 yards and a touchdown. Cordell Patterson had 182 kickoff return in the second uh, Was it the second half or second quarter for the Bears? Those were their lone bright spots on offense. The Bears are a horrific mess offensively. They have no running game. They attempted a franchise low seven rush attempts in this game. It, that just boggles my mind. You have a quarterback coming back from a dislocated shoulder injury. It's his first game back, and you're not even trying to run the football? I mean, it was a close game at half. 
and, and then the Saints just blew it open in the second half. Uh, so th there's no excuse for why they aren't running the ball. If Matt Nagy is such an offensive genius, he should figure out how to run the football. But it's becoming to a point where it's becoming glaringly obvious Trubisky isn't the answer at quarterback. Now, before this game started, I was willing to give him a pass no matter how bad he looked. Uh, because he's coming back from the shoulder injury. But then he came out and played, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is even worse than I could have ever imagined. Nothing is going right for the Chicago offense. Their quarterback is playing awful. There's no run running plays. Their play calling is atrocious. Like I just mentioned, you got a quarterback coming back from a dislocated shoulder and you call 54 pass attempts? Are you kidding me? Uh, everything is going wrong for the Bears right now. Trubisky isn't the answer, and the sooner the Bears accept that, the better. And it's even worse because they traded up to get him in the draft. They traded up from number three to number two to select him. And you got to remember, Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes were still on the board when they selected Trubisky. Deshaun Watson went on Good Morning Football a week before that draft and said, he dared teams. He said, pick Mitchell Trubisky over me and live with the consequences. And you know what? The Bears picked Mitchell Trubisky over Deshaun Watson, and they're living with the consequences. But because they traded up for him and that GM that's still there invested so much to get him, they're going to be stubborn when they get rid of him. They might let him play out his entire contract, but I'm sitting here saying your defense is talented now in, what, two to three years when Trubisky, when they finally realize Trubisky isn't the answer and move on from him, most of that defensive talent is probably going to be gone. They need an answer right now. Right now. And here's what I'm saying. Go to the Bengals. You trade a third and a fifth round pick for Andy Dalton. I know you're going to say that's a lot. I know you're going to say that's a lot for Andy Dalton. And it is. It's way too much for Andy Dalton. But the point is, overpay for Andy Dalton right now and get a guy that can come in and be slightly average. That is a massive improvement over Mitchell Trubisky. A guy that is slightly average. I think Andy Dalton can be a solid quarterback when he has talent around him. He has no talent around him right now. And he's awful. You, you put him with Allen Robinson, Tariq Cohen, Taylor Gabriel, and you give Matt Matt Nagy an actual quarterback who can move the football, I think Andy Dalton will be fine. So you, you massively overpay him, and that's why you give him a third and a fifth, because the Bengals can't say no to that. You, say, you, you, you go in and say, I'll give you a fifth-round pick for Andy Dalton, they'll probably say no. But if you give him a third and a fifth and sell them on uh, rebuilding their franchise, they can't say no to that, can they? Go all in on winning within the next year or two. Otherwise, you're wasting this defensive talent. I feel bad because I was saving that Andy Dalton bit for our Trade Palooza show tomorrow. But it's true. They need help. And I don't want to sit here and watch Mitchell Trubisky play another game. And neither does Troy Aikman, who was not even hiding his contempt for how much he hated this guy's play on Sunday. Once again, Saints win this one, and the Bears are in a lot of trouble. A wide receiver for the Bears, Taylor Gabriel, said they're going to be holding a players-only meeting, quote, soon to talk things out. And it's never good when players have to have a players-only meeting. Just saying. All right, next game up, uh, Baltimore at Seattle. Uh, Ravens win this one 30-16. Uh, Baltimore's riding high on a three-game losing streak, and Seattle snaps a three-game uh, winning streak. Both teams are now 5-2. and two. This game was absolutely stunning to watch. Another rain-soaked downpour of a game that impacted uh, uh, the play on the field. But Lamar Jackson ran over everybody in his way. Ran all over the Seahawks. Had them completely confused as the Ravens defense flat-out bullied the Seahawks in this game. I was stunned watching the Seahawks offense get bullied by this Ravens defense that I thought was mid-core. Mediocre, I should say. Uh, third quarter, uh, Lamar Jackson, is he's got him in the red zone, and it, and it gets the fourth down, and Lamar's frustrated. He, he's mad that they've been settling for field goals, and he comes to the sideline, and, and John and Harbaugh is looking at him, and John Harbaugh, 
there's video of this altercation. It's not an altercation. And there's audio of it. John Harbaugh asks him straight to his face. He goes, do you want to go for it? And Lamar Jackson's immediate response says, hell yeah, I want to go for it. And Lamar points off to the side to somebody goes, do you want to go for it? And you hear somebody shout, yeah. So then the offense comes back onto the field after a timeout. And Lamar Jackson, they just run a quarterback power play. Lamar Jackson runs right up the middle. Eight-yard touchdown run. And that was it. I love this new aggressive analytical nature by John Harbaugh, who has changed who he is as a coach basically in one off season. It's amazing. And I love it. And it's going to be that kind of aggressive tenacity that they're going to need when they get to the playoffs and they might be playing against new England. That's how you beat the Patriots. You've got to take risks and be aggressive. And I think the Ravens can take risks and be aggressive. Uh, that eight-yard touchdown run in the third quarter broke a 13-13 tie, and the Ravens never looked back in this one. Uh, if, if you go back and watch highlights of this game, Lamar Jackson had Ravens defenders flat-out confused everywhere. I mean, it wasn't just on running plays like designed runs. Even when he was, like, scrambling to buy time, you just saw Seattle defenders tripping all over themselves. They just had no answer for this guy. Uh, Lamar didn't have the greatest day passing. Like I said, it was a rainy day. And there were a couple drops, so his stat line could have been better. He went 9 of 20 for 143 yards and a sack. But the rushing, 14 rushes, 116 yards, and a touchdown. I mean, oh my goodness. Ugh. But that doesn't even compare to what the Ravens' defense in this game did. Uh, Earl Thomas, the former Legion of Boom member in Seattle, now playing for the Ravens, got some revenge in this game. Uh... They just got physical with Seattle. They got up in Seattle's face and got physical with them, especially with their receivers. They were got tight windows. Uh, I'm sorry, I just got distracted. I just saw breaking news on my phone. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break from the this uh, this recap to point out that the 49ers and Broncos have apparently just made a trade. Emmanuel Sanders has been traded to the 49ers. Wow. Uh, stunning trade here. It was actually something I was going to suggest tomorrow on the Trade Palooza show. Uh, 49ers send a third and fourth round picks in the 2020 draft to the Broncos for Emmanuel Sanders and a fifth round pick. Wow. That is a massive get for the 49ers. Wow. Uh that was something I was going to bring up tomorrow and say that the 49ers should do this to help bolster that wide receiver room. I was going to talk about this tomorrow. This was going to be one of the realistic trade proposals. My friend, Chance Cotum, texted me this over the weekend and said, should the 49ers trade for Emmanuel Sanders? He called this a day ago. Wow. Oh my goodness, what a big trade for the 49ers. 49ers are for real, folks. They're going all in and I love it. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick side note to mention that. We'll, we'll, we'll bring this back up later towards the end of the show, but wow. Emmanuel Sanders traded to the 49ers. What a big get. I guess that shows you what the Broncos are packing it in and giving up on their season. All right, back to this game. We were talking about the Ravens' defense. Uh, they got physical and bullied Seattle. Uh, Marcus Peters got an interception in this game. Russell Wilson's first interception of the season. Marcus Peters, who got traded to the Ravens this past week, uh, picked it off and ran it back. What was that, like 67 yards for a touchdown? Marcus Peters becomes the first player in NFL history to have a pick six for two teams in the same season. Uh, and then in the second half, uh, the Ravens' defense, defense held the Seahawks to three total points in the second half. The Ravens have completely changed who they are on defense. You know, we were talking about them a couple weeks ago being a pushover and Lamar has to is going to have to constantly overcome this defense to win games. Well, now the Ravens just went into Seattle and un, and unseated a guy who I was saying could win the MVP and made him look pedestrian. Russell Wilson went 20 of 41 for 241 yards, a touchdown and an interception and one sack. This was a massive statement win by the Ravens who were showing that they are for real. Okay, Lamar Jackson may not have the best passing day. He's going to run all over you, and our defense could bully you. Uh, there's no way getting around this. The Seahawks got pushed around and dominated in this game. Uh, 
Wilson had an okay day, but it was just okay. It was it wasn't the MVP like performance we've been used to. Is what I'm getting at. Ah, uh, this is a massive statement win by the Ravens. Massive. Once again, Ravens win this one, thirty to sixteen. Both teams now five and two, and you got to start taking the Ravens seriously, in my opinion. They don't have to have a prolific pass offense. They'll run for like 200 yards a game on you. And Lamar Jackson will make you look stupid. And that defense is starting to round into shape. Look out for the Ravens. All right, moving on to the Sunday night football game. Uh, sorry about that distraction in the middle. I literally saw the notification on my phone. Emmanuel Sanders traded in, in the middle of my sentence. And I had to stop because my mouth hit the floor. I'm like, I was literally going to talk about that tomorrow as a realistic trade scenario. I'm so mad. <laughs> Uh, all right, moving on to Sunday Night Football. Uh, Philadelphia at Dallas. Dallas wins this one 37-10. Dallas snaps a three-game losing streak and proves to 4-3. and three. Philadelphia in the middle of a two-game losing streak and falls to 3-4 and four on the season. Uh, Dallas dominates in all phases to win this game uh, and moves into sole possession of first place in the NFC East. Uh, the Eagles started slow again. They... they they won the toss in this game and elected to receive, which you don't really see anymore in the NFL. Everybody always defers. Eagles said, nah, we're going to receive. We want to start fast. Well, they get the ball, and they fumble it. Dallas recovers, scores a touchdown. And the Eagles are like, okay, it's only seven points. Then they get the ball back, fumble it again. Dallas takes the ball and scores. Now, all of a sudden, Dallas is up 14 nothing, and the Eagles are already down by double digits in the first quarter. And you're thinking, oh, my goodness, could you just not shoot yourself in the foot for more than five minutes. Sweet Jesus, Philadelphia. Ugh. And, and and it just kept rolling like that. I mean, the Eagles scored a touchdown in the first half, and they got seven points, and you're thinking, okay, you know, the Eagles, they're, they're a second-half team. We've seen that all year long. Uh, what are they What are they going to do? Well, Dallas piled it on big in the first half. It was 27-7 to at halftime. I mean, the Eagles are down 20 points at the half, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, talk about shooting yourself in the foot. More like shooting your entire foot off. Jesus Christ, Philadelphia. And I'm sitting there enjoying it. I'm sitting there thinking, I tweeted it out, could the Cowboys play the Eagles every week? Because literally every problem the Cowboys had was solved in this game. Uh, boring, predictable offense? Not anymore. Watch this pitch option to Tavon Austin for a touchdown. Uh, running game not really working? Watch Ezekiel Elliott run over a supposedly good defense. Everybody's hurt? Well, everybody was healthy in this game and played great, including Amari Cooper. Uh, Dak struggling? Dak played great in this game. 21-27, 239 yards, a touchdown, one interception, five rushes for 30 yards and a touchdown. Defense not getting anything done and linebackers not playing well? Watch them get four turnovers and harass Carson Wentz the entire game. It, it literally every problem the Cowboys have had the last three weeks went out the window and was not a factor in this game. This was the most complete slash best game the Cowboys have played this entire season. Their defense finally looked like it did last season. It finally resembled that. And I guess it just took playing a very woeless Eagles team for it to finally come out. Demarcus Lawrence got his first sack of his career against the Eagles despite playing them twice a year for the last three years. Carson Wentz had a bad day at the office. Uh, 16 of 26, 191 yards, one touchdown, an interception, three sacks, and two fumbles. Uh, oh my goodness. It, it's just... The Eagles aren't a good team. They're just not. I mean, Elliott looked regener uh, energized in this game. Ezekiel Elliott went 22 of rushes, 111 yards, and a touchdown. It was his best game so far this season. He just looked like a different runner out there. He was trucking people. It was great. Uh, uh, Wentz played bad in this game, and so did that defense. And I know they're hurt across the entire secondary. And I know that they're banged up even at linebacker. This was a must win for the Eagles. And they came out completely flat. They needed this game. And they no-showed. There was no way getting around it. The Eagles were completely flat in this game. And Dallas just had their way with the Eagles. 
Uh, the, 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 the Eagles are a sloppy team that's just going to keep dooming themselves. Uh, with these first half deficits that they have to keep coming back from, from these turnovers that are just dooming them. I, I mean, my goodness, you're you're three and four, and guess what? You're playing a really good Bills defense next week. You could be three and five, and things are not going to get better. Ah, uh, this 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 uh, this Eagles team is worrying me. I I said on our very first show that I thought the Eagles could win the NFC East this year. Well, this Sunday on the Fox NFL pregame show, Jimmy Johnson said. Whoever wins this game is going to win the NFC East, and I agreed with him when he said that. And the Cowboys won this game, so I guess the Cowboys are winning the NFC East. I know it's still early, and there's still an entire other half of the season left, but these Eagles, they're not good. They're way too hurt. They're flat. They're not into games. And you, you can't keep showing up to these games and be trailing at halftime by... 15 or more points. I mean, this is the second time this season, I'm pretty sure, where they've trailed by 20 points at the half. They keep doing this, and they keep losing as a result. That reflects directly on coaching and preparedness and energy that they're just not there in the first half. And that sucks because they're a talented team. Uh, once again, Dallas wins this one 37-10. Uh, Dallas improves to four and three, only team above 500 in the NFC East and are in sole possession of first place. Moving on to our last game, uh, Patriots and Jets. Talk about another oh god, one-sided beatdown. Patriots win this one 33 to nothing on Monday night. Uh, Patriots are now seven and zero and are the third and for the third time in franchise history for the Patriots are seven and zero. Jets are now one and five and a very uh, embarrassing loss quite frankly, to their division rival Patriots. Uh, Patriots defense dominates as Darnold, quote, sees ghosts. A lot of hub love about that. Uh, Sam Darnold was mic'd up for this game, had a microphone on him so you could hear what he said. And, you know, sometimes you get the mic'd up and you only hear it when they when a player scores a touchdown or gets their reaction to a big play. Well, uh, the Patriots were blitzing Sam Darnold on what felt like every single play. And he came to the sideline and told, I think it was his head coach, Adam Gase, that he was, quote, seeing ghosts. And if you don't know what that means, that basically means that he's feeling pressure that isn't there and he's panicking. Because they, they're constantly blitzing him. So even if there isn't pressure, he thinks that there is and he's reacting as a result. And that forces him into bad throws. Now the Jets are apparently not happy that ESPN aired that comment. And Adam Go Adam Gase, their head coach, is apparently very, very mad about it. I thought it was an interesting insight. We we could tell that the kid was panicking, but now we have confirmation that he was panicking. <laughs> uh, the Pats defense holds the Jets to 150 total yards, less than uh, 90 total passing yards, and six turnovers in this game. They only got one sack, but they were blitzing him the entire night. I mean, my goodness, Bill Belichick was going off on this kid. It felt like he was gaining pleasure from breaking the Jets. It really felt like he was gleaming pleasure from breaking the Jets. I'm sitting here watching the NFL Network right now, and they're replaying the game, and it's, and it's, the game just started, and the Patriots are in the middle of that seven-minute drive for a touchdown that they did to start the game. And the moment they scored a touchdown on that drive, I'm like, oh, this game's going to be ugly. <laughs> this game's going to be nasty ugly. Patriots literally just did an eight-minute drive for a touchdown to start the game. <laughs> this is going to be bad. Uh, like I mentioned, I think I mentioned it, yeah. The, the, the Falcons traded Mohamed Sanu to the Patriots. They're going to get even better offensively now that Mohamed Sanu is there. Pair him with Edelman, who will hopefully get healthier. And the same with Josh Gordon, who's going to get healthier. When they get healthy, they'll be better. They're going to be scary on offense. But here's the thing. The Patriots' offense could literally be, like, the worst offense ever. And this defense would find a way to win games. This defense is all-time great right now with the numbers they're putting up. I mean, it is scary what they are doing. And, yeah, they haven't played the best teams. And in the second half of their schedule, they're going to be playing more competent teams and quarterbacks like Lamar Jackson and Dak Prescott. 
who can you know they they aren't pushovers like you know the the Patriots have played so far this season. I mean, you could argue that the two best teams that the Patriots have played so far are the Jets and the Giants. That's really not saying a whole lot. Uh, but like I said, six turnovers in this one. I mean, oh my goodness, it was ugly. Sam Darnold went 11 of 32 for 86 yards, four interceptions, and a sack. Tom Brady went 31 of 45 for 249 yards, a touchdown, and an interception. Sony Michelle, the Pats running back, went 19 of 42 for three touchdowns. It was just as one-sided as one-sided can get, and probably it was the more... I don't want to say it was one of the more dominating wins this season because you got to remember the Ravens played the Dolphins in Week 1, and what a horrific mugging that was. I mean, oh my gosh, they could have called that at halftime. But the Patriots in this game, if I remember correctly, they were up like 24 nothing at the half? I mean, yeah, yeah. That, that shows you all you need to know. I don't think this is a referendum on how bad the Jets are. I just think it shows you how good the Patriots are. No, I don't know who can crack this code on how to score. It's not just beating this team. Somebody has to figure out how to score more than one touchdown against them. Because so far, who, who's done it? I think only one or two teams have scored an offensive touchdown against this Patriots team, this defense, throughout the entire week. And that's just one a game. Somebody needs to figure out how to score more than one offensive touchdown against this team. I don't know who can crack this code. John Harbaugh and those risk-taking Ravens? Or are we going to have to wait till we get to the Super Bowl and pray to God that maybe the 49ers can crack a code with Emmanuel Sanders now? Or Drew Brees and Sean Payton can cook up some crazy scheme? I just don't know what it's going to take to beat these Patriots. I just don't know. His defense is putting up all-time great numbers. They're going to get better with Mohamed Sanu. It feels like now more than ever, they are not only a lock to be in the Super Bowl, they could seriously go undefeated again. They could. These Patriots are scary, man. So that's it for our recap portion. Uh, I know we went quicker this this time around, a lot quicker. We did it like 30 minutes quicker than we normally do. I wanted to try out a new system of recapping games where I try to limit myself to about four minutes for each game. And I think it worked out well. I think we're going to do this going forward. Do smaller bite-sized podcasts. I like it better. So now we're going to get into the Thursday Night Football preview portion for a couple minutes. Uh, Washington at Minnesota. And then we'll sign off. Uh, so you got this one-win Washington team. And one of their only primetime, one of their two primetime games this year, going all the way to Minnesota to take on a white hot Vikings team. There, there are plentiful storylines abound in this game, but let's start with Kirk Cousins, who used to play for Washington a couple of years ago, and there was that bitter dispute because they didn't want to sign him to a long term deal, so they let him go. And where does he go? Minnesota. But Kirk Cousins is probably playing the best football of his career over these last three weeks over these last three weeks it's like nine it's nearly a thousand passing yards these last three weeks 976 passing yards uh 10 touchdowns and only one interception and basically in layman's terms he's playing white hot football supernova like football it's great football by Kirk Cousins uh and like we mentioned will Adam Thielen play in this game don't know his, his hamstring could limit him he might not play or he could in a limited role but they have Stefan Diggs who's been playing great football the last two weeks Mason Rudolph like I mentioned came back into the fold and you got Dalvin Cook so let's see what the Vikings roll out Thursday night then on the flip side of it you got Washington and you think well what's there to say about Washington a surprising amount actually there if, if you watch their games lately and I don't know why you would torture yourself like that it feels like the Washington defensive line has played better, I would say, the last three weeks, dating back to the New England game. They're, they're getting penetration and they're getting sacks. I, I I think this defensive line is playing better lately, and that could flummox a uh, a uh, Minnesota team if they're getting back there and getting uh, Kirk Cousins under pressure. But a uh, big question for Washington in terms of injuries, will Adrian Peterson play? If you remember, Adrian Peterson is arguably the greatest running back to ever play for the Minnesota Vikings. And 
He left a couple years ago, and this is now the second time, if I remember correctly, that he's gone back to Minnesota to play. So he, he's dealing with an an, uh, ankle injury. He says he's ready to go, but we'll, we'll see how much he plays. They're thin at the running back position. Chris Thompson's out. Darius Geis is still out. So who knows how much Adrian's going to play. Uh, so Adrian Peterson going back to Minnesota. You know who else is going back to Minnesota in this game? Case Keenum, the Washington starting quarterback. He was the quarterback in 2017 for the Vikings who led them to the NFC Championship game. The miracle in Minnesota to Stephon Diggs was Case Keenum. And he's going back to play in Minnesota. Like I said, a lot of storylines in this game. A lot of revenge storylines in this game. Uh, uh, but here, here's, here's a bigger storyline. Because it's followed Kirk Cousins' his entire career. Kirk Cousins does not play well in primetime games. He has a career record of 5-13 and 13 in primetime games. Five wins, 13 losses. And those 13 losses are usually pretty ugly. And, and the stigma that's always been around Kirk Cousins is that he doesn't show up for these big games. That it, he's going to be your guy if he's playing at the 1 o'clock Eastern game against a nobody team in his home stadium. He is your guy. And he will put up crazy numbers and he's going to lead your team to the win. But if he has to go out on a Thursday night, Monday night, or Sunday night football game against anybody... He's going to struggle. And that's that's just been his thing, and I don't understand why. And sometimes it feels like he's in his own head when it comes to this stuff. So, lots of storylines. Revenge subplots everywhere. Will Kirk Cousins once again struggle in primetime football? But I've got the Minnesota Vikings winning this one. I think Kirk Cousins stays hot and, and wards off some of that stigma. He's playing some of the best football of his career, and I think he gets a much-earned primetime win on Thursday Night Football. But if they go out and lay an egg against the Washington football team, oh my goodness, that will be very sad. So that uh, that does it for today's episode. Uh, remember to tune in tomorrow on Wednesday for our little bite-sized podcast. We're going to do a trade deadline special. Uh, we're going to talk about five teams that should be trading players and five teams that should be trading for players. And then we're going to do five... Uh, realistic trade scenarios that could actually happen. One of them was seriously going to be Emmanuel Sanders to the 49ers. So now I have to come up with a new one. Uh, So come on by tomorrow. It should probably be like a 30 to 45, maybe even 50 minute little podcast. And we're going to have some fun. Crack some jokes about some bad teams. So we'll talk tomorrow, and then we'll do our normal Friday show where we recap the Thursday night game and preview the rest of Week 8. We're almost halfway through the season, people. Almost halfway through the season. All right. Thanks for stopping by. Bye.